Dobre utro is actually, I think, the way that it, uh, that it, that it goes. Um, it's a, a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I'm sure that probably all of you, or maybe I'm the only one who actually, in fact, experienced this. Uh, uh, this seemed like a great idea six months ago, and <laughs> last night after the Blair Quartet left the dean's residence, I have a really great job and have really interesting people over for dinner. Um, and then especially this morning when the alarm went off so I could go over my notes early this morning. Um, this seemed like less of a good idea, but um, I, uh, I, I really enjoy doing this. Um, and uh, although increasingly this isn't the case anymore, looking around the room and there's some familiar faces, I still do slightly get to be the youngest guy in the room. Um, so there's something uh, to, to that as well. Um, this is going to be a, a six-week Sturm, a storm through um, pre-revolutionary Russian history. Uh, we'll, um, we'll look at loosely framed the politics, society, economy, and culture of the pre-revolutionary empire as it develops and evolves from uh, really the apex of its power and um, European prestige and influence at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century until um, the collapse and disintegration of that empire in the uh, revolution and civil war of the early 20th century. And conclude really by looking at what in some ways begins a new period of Russia's influence on the world stage albeit with the birth of the Soviet Union, where we'll end up in six weeks, um, albeit um, a very different kind of influence than the influence that Russia exerted in Europe at the end of the 18th century. So all I can promise you is um, uh, a roller coaster of sorts. Uh, I will try to keep stream of consciousness to a minimum, although I can't promise you that entirely. Um, I like to use PowerPoint and to get as much data up on the PowerPoint as I can. So especially for those of you who are um, note-taking as well, I, I hope that the, that the slides will serve as um, some way to anchor um, the material that, um, that, that, that follows. Today what I'd like to talk about um, is uh, autocracy and empire. That's basically the, the title of the, the lecture. And I'd like to really look at um, at the Russian Empire at it, the apex of its power and influence in the 18th century. In order to do that, however, ultimately, you know, the historian is confronted with a, a difficult dilemma because you have to begin the story somewhere. And you know, and certainly my teachers would have insisted, that the story of Russian history definitely doesn't begin in the 18th century. And there's another millennium of it that stretches out into a more distant past. And if we were to go there, um, I, I would have not two wires dangling off me, but I'd have 14 wires dangling off me, I, I, I think. So we have to find a place to cut into this history. And so really what I'd like to do is I'm, I'm starting in the 18th century, in some way somewhat arbitrarily, although today I think we'll also in the beginning of these comments bounce back um, to um, well, to Byzantium in the 10th century, to the Mongol Empire um, in the 11th, to the Khanates that succeed the Mongol Empire in um, the 13th and in the 14th, to Muscovy as well. Bear with me, um, uh, because really what I want to talk about today is not that stuff at all. I want to talk about Peter the Great and the 18th century state. But in order to do that, we do have to back up um, a little bit. Let's situate, though, just for, um, for starters, let's simply situate the 18th century empire. So at least we can say where we're going to end up. We can certainly say that um, a very familiar calculus for calibrating the powers of states, familiar to us today in the United States as we look outside our own borders, particularly to the east and particularly to China, is to calibrate state power with population. And the population of the Russian Empire in the 18th century is, as you can see from this slide, census technologies are very 
unsophisticated and backward. So these always are raw figures, but um, as these figures suggest, the population of the Russian Empire is growing dramatically over the course of the 18th century. Um, so that by the beginning of the 19th, the end of the 18th, it is in fact the most populous po power uh, on the European continent. Most of that population expansion, however, does not come from an increasing birth rate or a declining death rate, but rather literally from imperial expansion. That is the assimilation of more population, especially in the West. In the 18th century, Poland is eliminated from the European map, not to appear again until the end of, at the end of the First World War. The so-called partitions of Poland result um, from the 1770s through the 1790s, result in um, the assimilation of millions of new subjects into the Russian Empire, including um, the substantial Jewish population that lived in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, and much of which then is taken into the boundaries of the Russian Empire. Um, Ukraine and its own national history today in the 20th and 21st century, basically new literature in the history of, of, of the region. Um, Ukraine basically as an independent political entity also disappears in the 17th and 18th century and is taken within the boundaries of the Russian Empire where typically it's referred to not as Ukraina, that is literally on the edge, but as Little Russia, Malaya Rasia. Um, uh, but the slide basically states a basic fact of life. Um, if power is measured by population, when Europeans look at the Russian Empire by the end of the 18th century, what they see is a very powerful, but also relatively new European power on, um, on the international scene. Relatively new because now we have to slide back a bit. Um, relatively new because if we turn for a moment away from the empire, to an entire separate branch of Russian historiography. So for a moment we have to put on a different hat and think of ourselves not as students of Imperial Russia, but as students of early modern Russia, of Muscovy. And if we do that, we find ourselves actually, for the sake of this argument at least in this slide, we find ourselves in the year circa 1500. And if you had to do qualifying exams, you'd basically have to have about three or four or six more centuries back before this to explain how we got there. But where we are here is the presence of a consolidated territorial state known basically in Europe at this point as Muscovia or Muscovy, um, known actually in the sources as the Grand Principality of Moscow ruled by a hereditary clan, the Grand Princes of Moscow, one of a series of small city-states ultimately who vied for power in the previous centuries. And Moscow won that struggle and essentially by 1500 had put itself and its royal house at the center of a consolidated territory in north, far northeastern Europe with a army of sorts, a bureaucracy of sorts, a treasury of sorts, and royal rituals and um, uh, uh, legitimacy of sorts as well. Moscow was the center of that consolidated territorial early modern state. Although Moscow, of course, was, I think you can make it out on this slide, although I'm not exactly sure, not exactly the one that we're, we're accustomed to seeing on CBS Evening News. <laughs> right? um, it is in many ways a city of wood. This is, of course, a drawing that's not contemporaneous at all. Um, a city of wood in the, in the city, largely, that Napoleon, we'll hear more about him subsequently, that Napoleon burned. A key player in this story as we think about um, the, the rise of Muscovy as a state. A key player in this story is Ivan Grozny. Now Grozny basically is to threaten. Grozny means the terrible, but it means the looming, the all-impressing impressing 
terrible not only because, of course, he is murderous and arbitrary and possibly, ultimately, after 40 years of, of rule, crazy, but because of the impact that he actually makes on the population, because of his awesomeness. You can translate Grozny that way as well, although not the way that our students do, you know. Although perhaps, you know, there was a peasant who said, awesome, <laughs> when they looked at Ivan the Terrible. Right? <laughs> Ivan um, it belongs in this story as well because really one could argue that it's at this point that this consolidated territorial state begins to assume the trappings of empire, begins to uh, 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 assume the, the pretensions of empire begins to actually enter a phase of its history where the adjective imperial begins to appear and apply. Who, sir, who would be the main mover in that consolidation and that surge at the time? He is. I mean, and I want to, and, and basically, and I want to I answer that question. The question was, who would be the main consolidator? Who would be the main sponsor of that sort of, of movement, and while there are tons of answers, let's stick with the ruler. Um, the role that the state plays in Russian history is, um, is very important. There's a whole school of interpretation. In many ways, the first professional historians who began writing about Russia in the 19th century, native historians who wrote within the empire, were beginning in the middle of the 19th century, were actually labeled and self-described as the state school so that the agent of historical development and progress in Russia, if you think about it, was the state and ultimately the ruler. So let's stick with Ivan for a second and think about um, the state becoming imperial, the state beginning to move into a stage of imperial history. Several factoids, and here basically I suppose that's really all we can um, do. Ivan crowns himself autocrat. Now, his father and his grandfather um, and possibly his great-grandfather before him had all assumed this title, Samoderzhets, autocrat. And basically, autocrat means the legitimate concentration of all political power and authority in the hands of one person. Legitimate and respected. And in many ways, it was a title that all sorts of rulers were, um, were, uh, were uh, taking unto themselves at that time because it, it required a mark of legitimacy and respect from other rulers as well. But Ivan, in addition to crowning himself autocrat, also crowned himself Tsar or Caesar. And by doing that, he was very deliberately reaching out to two different imperial traditions that um, were to be found in Russia's history, providing that this thing will, uh, will help me. Uh, one had to do with um, a imperial tradition from which Russia had drawn its very religion. The Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Rome, which at the height of its power and influence, circa 11th century, although you know, across a millennium of history, there are series of apexes for Byzantine power as well. Um, the main point that's germane to Ivan and taking the title of Tsar or the title of Caesar is the fact that the Byzantine Empire had been conquered by the Turks in 1453 the modern-day city of Istanbul, of course, then Constantinople, disappears in 1453. And actually, if you read Russian chroniclers at the time, and this is true in other states in the region as well, that is chroniclers who are themselves Orthodox Christians. The conquest of Constantinople by the Muslim Turk was apocalypse. It, it, it conjured up images to be found in the book of Apocalypse. It was the end of time. It also raised a really interesting question for rulers in the region. Well, if there's no more czar in Constantinople, who is? And Ivan, 
for a whole variety of reasons that aren't being touched upon here, said, I am. <laughs> now, there were other competitors, but Ivan said, I am Caesar. I am Tsar. My autocratic power, which is legitimate and concentrated in the hands of one person, is unlimited and unconstrained. Now, there's a second imperial tradition that, um, uh, that Ivan reaches out to. And this is a bit closer to home because Muscovy and, for that matter, all of the Central European principal principalities or city-states that I referenced earlier. If you travel to Russia today, you go to Moscow, you travel east of Moscow to the cities of the Golden Ring, it's called, the Zolotaya Kultso, places like Rostov or Suzdal or Vladimir. They're all lovely because they all were behind the lines in the Second World War. They're all preserved. They all have a Kreml, a citadel, a castle, a Kremlin, and they all basically were competing city-states with Moscow once upon a time. And they all, from the 1200s to the 1400s, they were all subordinates and vassals of another great empire, the Mongol Empire that stretched from China almost to Hungary into the Balkan Peninsula and across the northeastern corner of Europe where these Russian principalities were to be found. That empire broke into pieces. The piece that ruled um, the Russian principalities was called the Golden Horde. And the Golden Horde, you can see its extent on, on this map. The Golden Horde subsequently broke into a series of khanates. Each one of those rulers, again, they're steppe empires, they're semi-nomadic peoples, rather than settled. Those, those khanates themselves basically laying claim to yet another imperial title and another imperial tradition the title and the tradition that was originally laid down by the great Khan himself, Genghis Khan. No one, perhaps, one would argue, no one was more successful at the business of the empire in human history than he was. That's what Russia confronted. And that's also what Ivan lays claim to. And he lays claim to it basically by going after these Khanates conquers in, in particular two of them. One in Kazan, which is if you think of a map, and I don't have one up here, if you think of a map of European Russia and think of where the Volga River is and how the Volga River basically drains the heartland of northern and central European Russia and drains all the way down into the northern shores of the Caspian Sea. It is Russia's, European Russia's Mississippi River and it's Mississippi River Valley. And it's as important to Russia's history as the Mississippi River Valley is to ours. You could write, if I stay alive long enough, I'm going to write a history of Russia that's actually grouped around right, the Volga River Valley and write it that way instead. It's a commercial artery. It's a transportation artery. It's a communication artery. And for long periods of time, it's actually a very important communi internal communication network between the markets of the Far East and Central Asia and the markets of um, uh, Eastern and um, East Central Europe as well. Two important cities sit on it. Two important Khanates sit on it. Kazan in the middle of Volga, Astrakhan at the mouth of the Volga, and Ivan goes after both of them and conquers both of them. And those conquests, which have political reasoning behind them, which have commercial reasoning behind them, and which have imperial reasoning behind them. Those conquests have three important um, consequences, which also allow us to get back to this question. So if Ivan is actually the propagator of these moves and these changes, this movement from being a state to being an empire, what are, what are the consequences of actually, in fact, conquering these two cities? Now, that map's not going to help people any, so you, you really have to, you know, if, 
get yourself, by, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, um, I always end up telling my students this, you, I'm assuming, have more geography than they do. Um, it, was, it was taught when you were in school. It's not taught as much anymore when they were in school. So when I say to them at this point in the stream of consciousness, get yourself a good map, I, I often have the impression they look at me and say, yeah, check. You know? <laughs> Although it's easier nowadays because most of them are actually on their laptops and they'll actually just boom, 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 and a good map comes up. Um, but if, you know, if these place names and whatnot aren't familiar, get yourself a good map and, th and, and take a look at the map and think about, um, ab about the map. Consequences of these conquests. Well, one certainly is the opening up of new frontiers. When you, when you control the Volga River Valley from its uh, headwaters to its mouth, it means that basically um, you begin a process of population movement, exploration, trappers, soldiers, and priests. One historian says, much like French Canada. <laughs> French Canada all the way down to New Orleans, right? <laughs> all those places in Illinois, my home state, that have these French sounding names to them. Where did they come from? And what in the heck was Père Marquette doing, portaging a canoe out of Lake Michigan into the Chicago River? You know, every Chicago kid knows this. Um, new frontiers. First, the Urals, across the Urals into western Siberia. And actually, by the very end of the 1700s, reaching the Pacific Coast and borderlands with the Empire of China, that result in the 1680s in the first commercial treaty between now a greatly expanded um, Russian imperial state and the Chinese empire as well. A second consequence of those changes is really to cement um, the title of autocrat and czar, to cement the imperial identity to the Muscovite royal house and to a royal line that, through a whole series of changes and circumstances, will stretch to its final holder, um, Nicholas II, in, in 1917. Ivan certainly recognizes um, this fact when he celebrates the conquest of Kazan and Astrakhan with the construction of one of the great tourist spots in all of Europe and certainly one of the great tourist attractions is the city of Moscow. Um, the Cathedral of the Intercession, better known as Vasily Blazheny or Vasily the Blessed. It's in honor of his father, Vasily the Blind, but it's also basically built, indicatively enough, in these years to mark his own imperial conquest. And thirdly, in terms of consequences, it also means that the Russian state has stepped outside of its ethnic boundaries for the first time and has assimilated into its territories um, other ethnic groups and particularly other religious groups. Generically known as Tatars, but a series of lesser ethnicities under that umbrella term what the conquest of Kazan and Astrakhan and um, the beginning of this exploration further east and southeast means is increasingly a confrontation between Orthodox Russia on the one hand and um, uh, the Muslim world on the other. And particularly um, a confrontation with, and it actually begins at the very end of the 1500s, um, a contact and confrontation with the Ottoman Empire, the other great young, dynamic, and growing empire in this part of the world. A confrontation, contact, confrontation, and conflict that will continue in a kind of minuet down until the First World War, when both of them, of course, will perish as a result of the dance. But imperial power, imperial pretensions, imperial scale, the presence of an empire in Russian history. We like to think of the state, but we have to think about the state and the empire 
when, um, when we look at, um, at Russia in this period of time. Let me pause for a second. Are there questions before I jump? Because now I want to basically spring from this direct, more directly into the 18th century and look at one of the really key figures. If Ivan is number is one, Peter is two. Although basically imperial historians would say that, well, Peter is one and Ivan's two, and Peter definitely would say that Peter's one and Ivan's two. <laughs> Although Yvonne would say that Yvonne's one um, and Peter's two, but that's a different story. Did Yvonne's family or clan stretch up to Peter? No, no. So ba basically um, uh, his, his bloodline, which he traces back to um, the, the Scandinavian princes that actually settle in the Dnieper River Valley um, in the 8th and 9th century, although whether those genealogical lines are true or not is a, impossible to determine, and B, lost in the mists anyhow. Um, uh, those bloodlines run out with his son who dies prematurely and initiates basically a period of uh, smuti, they're called, the time of troubles that really runs from you know, the first decade of the 17th century, the, the 16 aughts, and really only ends in 1613 with you know, I mean, a, a drama that is a five-act play with a cast of characters that's a Tolstoy novel um, that only ends in 1613 with um, the election of, of a new czar who's a Romanov and the founding of the Romanov house. So there's no direct um, genealogical connection between Ivan and the Romanovs. The traditions, however, the rituals, um, that even the discourse, if you will, the, I mean, discourse is a noun that you'll hear a lot from me, I'm sure, especially when I get not pressed into a corner, but asked to kind of comment like this about these huge leaps in time, right? So, and it's a fallback position in the academy. It's not a fallback position. It's actually a very interesting way to think about how it is that we as human beings interact with the world of symbols and language and um, discourse that surrounds us and influences the way that we think. So what gets passed on from my, uh, Yvonne is not, is not a genealogical connection, but what gets passed on is a set of traditions, a set of rituals, a set of values, a set of ideas that to be sure are changing and evolving with time, um, a discourse of imperial power and status traditions that influence a set of assumptions, behaviors, and actions, particularly in the elite realms of this, of this imperial state, okay? Any other questions? I yeah. I would like just one comment. And that is, no matter what poor old Ivan also did, he crowned himself. And I wish that he could be here to enjoy, perhaps he is, to enjoy our political, uh, um, I, I'd, I'd have to say I'd, I'd pass on uh, Yvonne yeah. returning, um, but uh, <laughs> I, you know I don't know. There, there, uh, there are there are times when my my position as dean uh, leads me, tempts me to actually explore Russian history for administrative solutions, but that would get me <laughs> into way too much trouble with faculty members, don't you think, Chris? <laughs> Um, uh, all right, so let's, let's, let's leap at this point and, and, and jab a second Roman numeral into the, into the notes. Um, and so let's actually turn from Muscovy uh, to the west, as this guy did, as Peter the Great did, um, and look at, at a really important and central reign in the story of, um, of the modern empire. Um, this... On my left, this first plainly also not contemporary uh, framing uh, shows a young Muscovite prince floating on a lake, on the river, um, the Moscow River, surrounded by two types of people. One, traditional aristocratic servitors, dressed as he is, connected enough to be in a boat with, in essence, the crown prince, and two other guys who were decidedly not in Muscovite garb. And although Muscovite garb might seem a little strange to our taste, particularly, and particularly to the taste of the other two European gentlemen, one probably French and one German sitting in the boat, 
Um, that garb wouldn't be all that unfamiliar, say, to the court of Henry VIII. Um, uh, it wouldn't be all that unfamiliar um, to, uh, to Tudor England, only uh, 70 or 100 years, 70 years um, prior. Um, but he is in a boat, and he is interested in technology, and he does have that guy without, with, a, with the wig whispering in his ear. And one of the arguments that's always made about Peter, and historians love to talk about turning points. You know, we basically, we have, we, we basically tell time. We write chronologies. In order to, to break those chronologies up, we have to find chapter headings, and we have to have section headings, and we have to have book titles. He's a turning point. He's a section. He's actually a whole library of books trying to understand him and through him to interpret the evolution of modern Russian history. Social scientists love transitions. Um, I don't know, I guess they're fuzzier than the humanists are. Um, so they can talk about, you know, less defined transitions. But this is plainly a key transition as well. And one way that it's often handled is to think about the turn from the east to the west, away from this very large and now sprawling imperial expanse that reaches out from northeastern Europe across northern Asia, sparsely populated, thickly forested, barely administered, claimed on a map, but what does that actually in fact mean? And away from that space, or for that matter, the step to the southeast, grasslands that are inland oceans, seas, impassable, wilderness without trees, Dikaya Polia, the wild fields they're called, grasslands that reach from Europe and the, the northern shores of the Black Sea into and across the, the, the southern ranges of the Urals and into western Siberia, like Nebraska, <laughs> like Kansas. But imagine walking it or traversing it and how impassable and ultimately dangerous those places are to sedentary and settled civilizations. All of that is part of the imperial story. And all of that remains a concern for Peter. But Peter also is looking to the west, to England, to France. Actually, really, his main influence and his main model are the Dutch. The Dutch who, um, at this very period of time, at the end of the 17th century, regard their art, regard their commerce, regard their wealth, regard as a very famous and popularizing historian, Simon Shama says in a book title, regard their embarrassment of riches. The Dutch for Peter, now that was civilization, right? And actually as a young man, shortly after this, after this picture is taken, Peter actually goes on a grand tour and his grand tour is to dress up basically as a ship carpenter and to go with a, a royal circle to a variety of places. He ends up in England, he sees Parliament, he actually, but it's in Amsterdam that, and in Holland that he finds his, um, his biggest influence. Um, when we talk about Peter, we basically talk about, we turn his name actually even into an adjective. Petrine, and the Petrine reforms. And to, to talk briefly about these reforms, which allow him to be coded as great. Now, great doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's in agreement, or that everybody thinks that he actually is great, but certainly that he's momentous. Certainly as his contemporaries, although he loves the title, it's not as if he's accorded it. His court votes it to him. But it's still, you know, it pounds a marker into the historical ground, um, saying something about the, the momentous character of the reign. And one way to think about that in turn is to think about the reforms that he actually conducts. First and foremost, and I should add, I guess, here um, as well, to think about some other themes of Russian history 
that are actually found in a discussion of these reforms. First and foremost for Peter is the military revolution. Peter looks west and he sees nauka. The word is in Russian. He sees science. But science at the beginning of the 18th century in particular is technology. And technology at the beginning of the 18th century is especially being driven, not solely, but is especially being driven by the increasingly thirsty needs of European states to acquire the defense and military power necessary to defend state interests, expand state power, and assimilate more population, and to make sure that your population isn't, in fact, assimilated. Now, it's interesting, actually, in that regard, thinking about technology, to look at this contemporary broadsheet, more or less, of a new soldier who, prior to Peter's reign, didn't exist. Lifeguard, Preobrzezhensky Regiment, and infant massed infantry regiment didn't exist. The musket that he's carrying, although other cruder forms of firearms existed, the musket that he's carrying didn't exist. The drill necessary to move a body of men to a place close enough to another body of men where they could all at once fire at this other body of men rapidly enough that more of them would fall than more of this block would fall didn't exist. The background's interesting as well. The forts, the fortifications, which of course require engineers to build them. They might not have been called civil engineers, but they were. It required geometry and trigonometry and mathematics and construction science to build them and to bombard them and destroy them. You can, as I'm rambling on, you can read the note and it becomes a little bit more clear. Um, he's interested in technology and military science. He, over the course of a reign that goes from the 1680s until the middle of the 1720s, almost as long as Ivan, he basically establishes obligatory military service for all noblemen. To be noble is to serve. Your blood becomes blue through service, not through birth. And all noblemen are obliged to serve. There are all sorts of ways around this. You know, you basically, you get pregnant, you enroll your kid in, um, uh, in a regiment. Um, they're done with service by the time they're actually 14 or 15, and you move on. There's always a loophole. But, right, the, the larger point is obligatory service for the elite, for the nobility, and conscription as a fact of life for the peasantry in a larger um, uh, in a larger uh, mass military, and finally, economic development even, that largely is put to the service of the military. So there is a burst of state-sponsored industrial development during the 40 year, uh, years of Peter's reign. And you can see the classic industries of the age being developed. Metallurgy, shipbuilding, textile manufacturing. Think about it for a second. Classically, people would say, you know, metallurgy. An axe, all peasants have them. A church bell, all Orthodox churches ring them. And a cannon uh, to bombard the fort. Shipbuilding, he builds fleets both on the Sea of Azov um, and on the Caspian. And he also, once he establishes St. Petersburg, builds a fleet as well on, um, the, uh, on, on the Baltic. Cloth, metal, wood, pitch, tar, sailors, right? a whole industry that basically then begins to develop around the military and textile manufacturing. You need uniforms for all these soldiers and all these sailors. Second aspect of, of the reform. I mean, Peter basically designs a state mechanism. He designs a modern state. He expands the state. He professionalizes the state. So we can actually talk about the государство, the state. 
It's interesting also that he basically polishes and refines and shapes an understanding for the population of the sovereign or the gasudar. And note in, in Russian how the one word for the person, for the sovereign, is buried inside the impersonal noun for the state. Peter, like the Sun King, Louis XIV, regarded himself as the first servant of the state. He wrote in a, a thing called the General Regulation, the Generalny Reglament in 1718, um, a regulation that was actually literally said things like, and you show up at the office at 8, and you stay at the desk until 5. I'm ad-libbing a little bit, but it's literally like that. You wear these certain clothes if you have a certain rank. You act in this way. This is how, in essence, again paraphrasing, but this phrase is in there. This is how things operate in mayo gasudarstva, in my state. It's an interesting way to build an impersonal state mechanism. You embed yourself in the institutions of the state, but the person of the ruler is so fully embedded in the institutions of the state that the line between the personal and the impersonal, the line between the institutionalized and the arbitrary, is always fudged, always blurred. The regular and the arbitrary are two basic facts of governmental and state life for all subjects of the autocratic crown. But he does build a system. And this is an interesting quote. As, again, as I was rambling, I hope you were reading, this comes from a Russian historian, Yevgeny Anisimov, who studies um, Peter the Great and wrote a book about him 10 or so years ago. And, and it's, a, it's an interesting way of capturing the proto-technocratic, to call Peter a technocrat at the beginning of the 18th century, is to use language sl sloppily. But you know, by nature, a technocrat, he delighted in things that worked, like a state mechanism itself. And his ambition for the Russian polity was that it should fulfill its God-given function to mobilize the resources of the people and land to ensure the defense and the prosperity of the, of the realm. Mobilization is a key word here, one that you wouldn't be able to find in the political vocabulary of the early 18th century, but certainly an idea all noblemen serve. I am the servant of the state. The purpose of the state is to assure its defense, power, prestige, expansion, and commonweal. Those are mobilizing ideas. To mobilize the resources of the people and the land to ensure the defense and prosperity of the realm. He viewed the state as a mechanism. You can actually go to Paterhof. Some of you probably have. Um, uh, the, uh, one of the main palaces to the west of, of the city of St. Petersburg and see the waterworks that Peter actually participated, the fountains that he constructed, personally, supervised. They're marvelous. They work with gravity. You know, There's, this is incredible. If you're an engineer, you'd go there and just go, oh, wow, right? He was, it was a mechanism. He was, in that sense, a clockmaker as well. And over the course of his lifetime, actually strove to create and in important ways, as a political historian, when you look at the state that exists at the beginning of the 20th century, he not only strove to create, he in important ways created the institutional outlines of the modern state that still existed in 1917 and in some ways serve as a foundation for the state that exists today. He put people to work this very quickly. Right? He mobilized the population. A table of ranks that he created in 1722. Everyone serves, and everyone serves on a flowchart. The national flowchart, think about it. If you make it to rank eight, you're ennobled. And even if you're a nobleman, family honor and prestige demands that your son, never daughters here, not at this time, actually serves to rank eight and attains ennoblement as well, even though the family in previous generations had already done so. Especially though, since this is a new creation in 1722, there is all sorts of conflict between blood, old blood, and service, new blood. Right? This is a time where nouveau types can actually go from nothingness to great power and prestige. But a table of ranks, what's missing here is actually a separate rank category for the imperial court. 
a table of ranks that bespoke, especially to the elite of um, this empire, that bespoke the service ethos of a service state and the new traditions that Peter had established. And similar sorts of comments can be made um, when we think about education and culture. Technology is, again, those of you who are engineers in the room will certainly agree. Um, if you're a graduate of this engineering school, you have to agree. Technology is arch education. In some ways, probably, dare I say it as a, as a humanist, more education perhaps than I have. Um, Peter's uh, notion of education, especially early in his reign, was quite utilitarian. One didn't go to university to get a liberal arts education to find oneself. One went to university to acquire knowledge, particularly of science and technology. Over the course of his reign, his understanding of education and culture expands beyond technology, the military and the state. One could say, although even the city itself is formed from a military impulse, that perhaps his greatest monument to culture and to cultural risk is the city that he named after himself and that he basically began building in 1703 after a military victory over the Swedes. Everybody knows it's called, you know, the window onto the west. Muscovite, semi-Asiatic, isolated in backward Russia, along comes Peter and hence his greatness. He throws open the window. Solzhenitsyn would rant and rave about what came through the window. What came through the window ultimately for Solzhenitsyn was Marx. And via Marx came Lenin. And via Lenin came the 20th century of the Soviet Union in chaos. So to throw the window open for some, wasn't a good thing at all. But by the end of his reign, a year before he died, he established the Academy of Sciences, an Academy of Sciences which still exists today, the Kunstkamera, in 1724. There are, and I want to talk now, I want to move beyond um, Peter to think a little bit about the dynamic tensions to be found in his reign and thus some of the dynamic tensions to be found in this discussion of imperial politics and the imperial state in the 18th century. When, um, when German historians in particular look at the continental states of the early 18th century, they're prone to talk about the, so, the Polizeistadt, which oftentimes in English is, is translated as the police state. But the problem with that notion is that it immediately begins to conjure up, for American minds in particular, ideas of certainly the authoritarian state, but the totalitarian state as well, the police state. And we think especially of the modern Soviet Union or um, uh, Stalinist Russia, polities such as that. Hence, the policed state. This quotation from the time, the police is the soul of citizenship and of all good order, essentially argues that bureaucrats charged with the administration of the internal affairs of the state, its public order, its domestic tranquility, its common defense, its common weal, the welfare of the people, that those are all charges that are incumbent upon the well-ordered police state. And in that sense, the state, the police, a branch of the state, the police is the soul of citizenship and the guarantee of good order because ultimately it establishes the administrative framework that surrounds the polity. It's the state that ultimately guarantees an environment that allows self-interested individuals to pursue their self-interest without killing each other. If you read Thomas Hobbes, an English political theorist, at the end of the 17th century, Hobbes in a book called Leviathan basically argues that the state has to be Leviathan-like. He also got Ivan the Terrible 
the state has to be awesome. As St. Paul said, it wields the sword in this shadowy existence that cannot, because it's the city of man, approach the city of God at all. And the state really has to wield the sword to assure citizenship and good order, an environment in which people will pursue their self-interest, but if you take self-interest to its logical extreme, I get to kill you because you're in the way of my self-interest. And how do I know that as soon as I turn my back, you're not going to kill me to pursue yours? The state's one way of doing that. An Englishman, not a Russian, an Englishman called that state Leviathan. Of course, then came John Locke, and you know, he, he had some opposition to that notion. Well, I'm not here to say yes, yes or no. Right? One way, though, of thinking about this, were they right, um, is to actually expand the discussion a little bit more and to think about a general trend in European history in the 18th century, enlightened absolutism. This is always a Western Civ ID question. You've got to be able to answer this one. So what you, you know, we're, we're moving by post-Peter, and in the 18th century, we're, we're moving into the period of the Enlightenment. And a shift in modes of thinking on the part of Europeans, particularly European intellectual elites. A shift that basically privileges human reason, human rationality, and human regularity. Reason, rationality, regularity as the element in the human that governs and controls human nature and human passion, which after all can lead the two of us to want to kill each other to assure our self-interest. Reason, rationality, and regularity as the element in nature that governed all natural phenomena. Even if we didn't quite know those regular patterns or laws quite yet, but they were there to be discovered. You know, that reason or regularity governing all of nature, some people call that reason God. Other people, Thomas Jefferson, called it the deity. Still others called it supreme reason. After all, when Isaac Newton at the end of the 17th century discovered the laws governing physical motion in the entire universe, Newton never doubted that a divine power or a god put them there. They weren't contradictory at all, but his worldview simply privileged reason and regularity and rationality. It's an interesting point of view, isn't it, at the beginning of our 21st century? Where did that go? And what did it actually produce? But that's a way longer story for people more expert than I. In the realm of public affairs, this enlightenment shift privileges law and legality and lawfulness. And you've been reading this, so I'm not going to read the slide to you. But you can basically see an argument here for why it is that the crown the ruler, the state, ultimately assures order, prosperity, and the common good of all. And that, especially for an enlightened empress like this one, who corresponded with Voltaire, who corresponded with Diderot, who was known to all the philosophes of France, such a ruler could actually create such an enlightened order. Now, one simply needs to note in all of this what I suppose, um, before we go on to this, what I suppose it was that American founders noted as well. Uh, well, enlightened absolutism is compulsion. And compulsion is not necessarily a guarantee of freedom. Order guarantees economic prosperity and self-interest, but order and liberty are not at all the same thing. Responsibilities as a subject or a citizen of the realm is not at all the same thing as rights. Privileges within a hierarchy is not the same thing as the universal rights of man. 
these are discourses, of course, that are only slowly beginning to emerge, and they're only emerging out on the edge of the wilderness in this weird place called North America and in parts of England as well, but largely religious dissenters, all of whom are being thrown in jail or, or, or fleeing to, um, to other climes. A king in England has already had his head cut off for um, thinking that he was an enlightened absolutist. Um, and another king, of course, will have his power overthrown in the 1770s. Um, in this notion of the policed state or of enlightened absolutism, there are great tensions, and tensions, of course, that we'll only be able to see further on down the road. Um, there are equally um, tensions as well. What time do we actually end? Are we, do we end at 10.30? Excellent. Okay, great. Then, then we're straight on time. Unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> Um, so uh, there's also, uh, let's, let's, uh, thinking about these sorts of, of, of tensions. Peter couldn't do all of this simply by himself. The table of ranks and the insistence that nobles serve and the creation of a state mechanism that was deemed to be modern and sophisticated, and if you'll allow me simply the reference, Dutch or European, was all designed to create a service elite that would assist him in the cultural and political transformation that he was envisioning. Uh, uh, Columbia historian, one of my teachers, Mark Ryef, um, wrote about the well-ordered police state and its need for so-called Kulturträger, they're called in, in German. Literally, cultural standard bearers. And you know, in a sense, Peter has this vision. Imagine how big this place is, how vast these territories are. And whether in Moscow or St. Petersburg, you know that, I mean, how delimited ultimately the view of the ruler must be. There's no telegraph, there's no television, there's no train. Distances are traveled, are covered in weeks or in months, not in days or in hours, in order to rule, the ruler has to be either physically present or has to have representatives to represent him. Has to have, in Peter's sense, Kultetreger, cultural standard bearers, and these are the nobility. You will be European. The barber wants to shave the beard of the old believer. Now, this is a woodcut from the period. This is a form of political protest. Not by a peasant, but by a traditional nobleman, a boyard. Henry VIII, here he is. And of course, the beard is, as in Orthodox Jewish um, cosmology, is a mark of God. And to shave it off is a sacrilege and an insult to God. But they don't have beards. And they shave in the West. So basically, Peter, through, I mean, this is a series of proclamations and resolutions. You know, if you appear in my court, there's a huge tax levied on you immediately. You can't walk through the gates of the Kremlin if, you don't, if, you're, if you're unshaven. You have to wear European clothing. You must do this. You must do that. You must serve. So. This particular boyar, this particular old nobleman who also is a Raskolnik, so it means actually he's a religious dissident as well. It's a part of a story that goes back to splits in Orthodox Christianity at the end of the 17th century. So this religious dissident as well, um, who basically not only has family tradition, but religious tradition and sensibility behind him says to the barber, and it's obvious who the barber is, you know, Listen, Barbara, I do not choose to shave my beard. God soon will punish you. Well, look, well he dies eventually. You know, I mean, he dies in 1725. It's not as if God punishes him. But what's also what's present in that woodcut is a kind of split within the nobility itself, a nobility that fully embraces Peter's reforms and fully embraces his westernizing tendencies. The great aristocratic clans of the empire, some of them perish at the beginning of the 18th century, some of them become more declassé, 
Others rise to prominence whose names weren't as prominent genealogically a hundred years previously as they are in 1725 when Peter dies. But the larger point is, is that to be successful, to be prominent, to do what all of us ultimately are concerned to do, assure the well-being and the placement and the status of our next generation, well, I don't know, you can call it conformity or you conform or you accept or you enthusiastically emb embrace the new cultural standards and you carry them. A more secular and less religious world. A more scientific and less mysterious world. A world in which you speak German and later French and then Russian. And so, so that perhaps by the end of the 18th century actually the, Ru the, the Russian that you're peasants speak and the Russian that you speak is increasingly disconnected and in fact you know you're not even speaking your native language as well as pe Ill Ill illiterate peasants are. One also sees however basically you know the trappings of the Russian aristocracy emerging in the 18th century conveyed by this slide conveyed by the great family names on it the Shiremetyevs, Patyomkin, um, Catherine the Great's um, closest confidant and advisor, the first woman to actually be the president of the Imperial Academy of Sciences, Ekaterina Varantsova Dashkova, two family names, hybrid, both of them very prominent, both, both of them very important, all of these names to be found in one fashion or another in genealogical records at the end of, um, at the, end of the old regime. Okay, in the last ten minutes now, I want to abruptly say everything that I said previously, forget it. None of it actually is important at all. <laughs> None of it has anything to do with anything. Because basically, only one, and this is a really rough figure, only one of ten of the subjects of the crown, and you saw the population statistics at the beginning of the lecture, and they're growing over the 18th century. O about only one in ten are elite enough, i.e., noble, aristocratic, living in a city, somehow or another qualified, perhaps by education, but university education here really doesn't figure all that much, somehow or another qualified via education, homeschooling often, to be in the elite. Nine of every ten subjects of the crown are peasants. And all of them in one fashion or another are serfs. And there's a good argument to be made, except I've never had much luck doing this with, under, with undergraduates because usually as soon as, say peasant, and you can actually see eyeballs begin to ro roll in the, um, in the audience. Right? <laughs> Early modern historians and colleagues in the English department who um, oftentimes will get at the shifts and changes that are taking place in um, early modern North America or early modern Europe by talking about witches and witchcraft and witch trials and you know why are people burning women because they think they're witches what's going on and how does that actually speak to the time student eyes would roll at witches and student eyes would roll at peasants but I don't want to give a, a separate lecture on peasants because that would be way too much I tried a course one time that was way too much but I basically do want to explore the statement that I just made forget everything else and let's for a moment just consider that the real history of Russia is being written on this slide um, in, in the following sorts of ways. Demographically and sociologically, nine of every ten subjects of the crown are represented here. Sociologically, a basic fact of life here is labor, rabotit, to work, rab, its root, R-A-B-O-T-A-T, -T. rabotit, to work, its root, R-A-B, rab, slave. Rabot, which actually isn't a Russian word, but it's a Polish and Czech word, rabot, change the accent, and you have rabot, rab, robot, right? And people will make that connection as well. A basic, the basic fact of life. Could I add parenthetically? Oh, well, this is just the 18th century. What percentage of the global population today do these comments apply to? 
Who's more relevant? People in this room? Yes, obviously. <laughs> or people sitting in a village someplace in any number of places across the globe who labor for good reasons. They labor not to make profit, so you've got to rule that out. Capitalism's not here yet. Adam Smith only writes at the very end of the 18th century. They don't labor to make profit. They labor to subsist. They labor to pay money and labor obligations to a landlord, a surf lord, or the state. And those obligations can be in cash, but it's not much of a cash economy yet, so they're really in kind. Working on somebody else's fields, taking part of your crop and giving it to somebody else, or push really comes to shove, taking a son and handing him to the army for 25 years. And classically, that annual event in the village, ethnographers tell us, was essentially accompanied by funereal ritual. Because mothers and daughters and wives knew that was it. This person would never be seen again. To subsist, to pay money and labor obligations, and of course the final thing, to reproduce. Because you labor ultimately to get calories, and you need calories in order to reproduce and assure the continuation of your family line and, sur and its survival as well. You need sons especially to work, and you need daughters to marry so that you can connect inside the village and be a bigger person 10 years down the road than you were when <laughs> you were settled with three daughters and one son like I am, but, um, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Principal crops, what do you grow and what do you do? You grow rye, you grow oats, you grow wheat. You have a cow. She the cow belongs to the woman. It's a source of dairy. It's a source of fertilizer. It's a source of spiritual protection for the house and the home. Forest products. Historically, agricultural yields are very low. An agricultural revolution beginning by the middle and end of the 18th century in Europe, the potato, for example, basically isn't present in the Russian lands at all until into the 19th century. Certainly mistaken to think of a countryside that is static and fixed. People do other things than farm. The souvenirs that we buy today, pretty trinkets made of metal, wooden spoons and bowls, silk shawls. You know, you can go to any stand in Moscow or St. Petersburg and buy all this stuff and bring it home and give it for Christmas or whatever. Um, all of that are, are, all of those are branches of artisanal industry and artisanal handicraft. Um, long traditions identified to particular villages. The blacksmith is important. The woman who spins and weaves in her hut eventually basically becomes part of an evolutionary process that leads to a textile industry by Peter's time and subsequently. Most of it run by serfs, the great entrepreneurs at the end of the empire, the Vanderbilts of the Russian Empire at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, most of them actually have roots in, 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 in peasantry and in serfdom. Tretyakov, for example. If you go to Moscow, the Tretyakov Gallery, one of the great art collections in Europe, privately held before the revolution in 1917, Tretyakov traces his family line back to serfs who became wealthy enough via textiles and these handicraft industries to buy their way out of serfdom before emancipation in the middle of the 19th century. Migrant labor. These guys, the infamous or famous Volga boatmen who are, you know, men, men, uh, they rent themselves out as a labor unit. So they're like that because they actually go as a collective. Their lord might rent them out as the labor collective. They earn money as a result of the labor, as does the Lord, but they travel all over the place. In any given season, upwards of a quarter of the population is probably, this is really vague and a, and a guesstimate, is probably on the move. So that migrant labor here in the 17th and in the 18th century is a basic fact of life. 
there aren't, I'm not going to get too political here because somebody will throw a tomato at me if I said there aren't any fences at borders to actually make sure that these people don't move across a line on a map. Um, but mig migratory labor is, it's a field of study. Um, it's, as, it's as human as human history. Um, and then finally, uh, as, we're, as we're moving towards a close, serfdom. Because all of these peasants are owned by someone. Three major groups of owners, private noblemen who own upwards of, by this period of time, um, upwards of about half of all peasants. The state treasury, which owns about 40%, and the royal family, which owns another 10%. Now, ownership here is basically a word that we really have to distinguish. Um, as in these last couple of minutes, I'm coming to an end, um, that we have to distinguish from American slavery. But clearly, by the time you're looking at serfdom at the end of the 18th century, um, the easiest analog, the closest one at hand for us, is American slavery. And the most interesting analog, actually, is to think about the Russian peasant village and slave row. Now, what's remarkable about Slave Row, especially when you look at it from the point of view of the Russian village, is that Slave Row basically has kitchen gardens attached to individual houses that slave families will work. But the labor force that lives on Slave Row does not have its own farm or arable land. It's a labor force that's employed on plantation fields. In the Russian village, on the other hand, the village typically has kitchen gardens attached to household that has its own arable land, whose farming is managed, whose farming is conducted by individual households, but is managed by the vil village as a whole. Often we'll talk about communal agriculture. When to plant, when to harrow, when to seed, when to harvest, when to manure how to operate the agricultural calendar that governs life in a village over 12 months. That arable land, which maintains ultimately households and allows individual households not only to subsist, but to meet the obligations that the village has to the outside world. The state, give me your sons for the army. The Lord, pay me my labor obligations the state and the Lord. Pay me my money. Taxes and debt. Right? The basic facts of life. Those demands, when they're imposed upon the village, is imposed upon a village that does ultimately have some passive ability to resist. Not to actually stand up and fight. Not to protest. But a famous saying is that it's a sin to work energetically on the Lord's land. <laughs> the Brits call it skiving. You, know, you can find a way around any rule or any regulation. This is, a, this is a story on Slave Row as well. But Slave Row, of course, lacks what the state and the Lord, actually, they need the productivity not only from the person, but they need the productivity ultimately from the land as well. You could say, there are, because there are certain periods when, uh, in fact, the peasantry rebels. There are three great rebellions, actually, at the end of the 17th and into the 18th century. The largest and greatest of them, the poet, Russian poet, um, uh, Pushkin writes about it in the beginning of the 19th century, is the so-called Pugachev uprising, check the dates. It's interesting what's taking place on the edges of the Atlantic world. All right? This is in the Volga River Valley, basically, where there's a huge uprising that goes for almost two years, requires great expenditure of state resources and military resources to put it down at one end of the world. And out there at the other edge of the world, there's something else going on in 1774, 1775, and 1776. Very different kinds of rebellion, of course. Now, I said, OK, um, forget everything that I said. But don't forget everything that I said. 
um, we are going to now drive ourselves in the next five lectures toward 1917. That's, that's the end game. And to actually get to 1917, we have to understand the state. We have to understand the empire. We have to understand its political traditions and its political values. We've seen something of its society and culture, and we'll look at that more in the next two lectures. Um, but we also have to understand something that's most unrecoverable of all. These people don't talk. They don't leave records directly in the archives. You can find police reporting about them. You can find courts ruling against them. But it's very difficult to figure out exactly what is it that they actually are thinking and doing, and how do they, in fact, understand the world. But to get from the 18th century, and one bookend of it, of course, is permanent military conscription and service to the state. And occasionally somebody's saying, Daloy, down with that. Pugachev was a Cossack, actually, not really even a peasant. To get from the 18th century to the 20th century also leads us to this broadsheet. It circulates around a lot. Um, it's translated, I don't know if you can actually make it out here, but it's, it's actually a classic framing of an imperial society. It's not horizontal. It's not made into matrices. It's not a Facebook society. It's not a democratic polity that would allow for consensus. It's a hierarchical world that's focused with increasing narrowness toward the top toward the apex, toward the ruler. It's a world that's very familiar. Actually, the Facebook world would make no sense to somebody in the 18th century. This world makes total sense. You're born to a place, you die in a place. We rule over you. We govern you. We pray for you, priests, bureaucrats, rulers. We shoot at you, soldiers. Um, we, I, this one I can't make out, um, and I forget who's actually here. We work for you, workers, because this is the early 20th century. We feed you, peasants. Now, you know, one story in 1917, and we could go home right now, actually, is that what Pugachev wrote about, what, what Pugachev did at the end of the 18th century, and Pugachev and Pushkin referred to as, you know, the bloody Russian Revolution. Happens again at the beginning of the 20th century. And these people, like, you know, my favorite book that I read as a kid, Yertle the Turtle. <laughs> Finally went, oh, I've had it. <clears throat> right? And the whole thing came tumbling down. Now, that's not the only explanation, but um, it is one way of thinking about why it is that the history of nine out of ten of the empire subjects is absolutely just as important as the history that um, uh, Peter and Yvonne and Catherine wrote um, in this time period. So we'll uh, keep up with this again uh, next week. And uh, don't forget to check a map. <laughs> All right.